Hold on. <laughs> All right, so we have two um, with us. So let's wait a couple. I mean, other than us, it's just us in a room. <laughs> just it's us a cozy, room. cozy room, friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew they wouldn't be dancing. I'm sorry. Um, that's mental health. Repair. It is. It is. It is. Mental health repair. <laughs> I was going to say that when we started talking, I'm like, I was like, thinking about what I had really done to repair, to cope with whatever verbiage needs to go in there. What's going on? And I made this little list. It's the funniest list, but I guess we'll wait. <laughs> wait a couple of minutes. I mean, I think, yeah, I've got some things too, but some of them are not like the best, you know? Some of them are not the best things. So sometimes we create coping mechanisms that are just serviceable and our our characters do this too. They're just what they know, especially when you're a kid, you're just like, I'm going to do the thing that works. Never mind that if, if it's good or not for my mental or physical health. So, you know, and or, then, no. or it is, and people don't recognize that's that's what I'm doing with what we were just talking about. We were just talking about Naughty Soul and her coping mechanism with her television show. How many people are yeah. on TV? <laughs> well, that is her coping mechanism, and that is also her dream. It's sort of like her, um, you know, uh, you know, intentionally, the pun is intentional, a whitewashed version of America that she feels is like, well, this is the thing that I, you know, I can strive for. I, if I, perfect my English. If I, you know, if I make it there, it will be like this. And it's, she finds out quickly that it is, it is not. Well, as we wait a couple of minutes, um, definitely anyone who is out there listening, please give a shout out in the chat box. Welcome. Yeah, let us know you're there. Or we, we could just talk, talk to ourselves. We do this all the time. We could talk to ourselves for just hours, but let us know you're there. Let us know where you are from. That would be great. Yeah, and if you are a writer, because uh, we have lots of things to say, Basically, we just have lots of things to say, but we have lots of things to say about craft. But if also if you're an educator or just somebody who's interested in this topic, let us know. Yeah. So what we are doing here today is talking about mental health in our books and in our lives and with ourselves as creators. So I thought it was funny. I was talking to Alex and also Mia <laughs> and kind of talking about how we're conducting a seminar on a topic with which we struggle ourselves, mm -hmm. myself, questionable mental health, <laughs> co-leading no. um, yeah. a, a seminar. But you know, that, that makes us valid and authentic. So. Right. And so you, you, you know, like, I think we said this on the website and we'll say it now again, that we are obviously not mental health professionals. We are people who experience uh, mental health issues. We have in the past, do right now, we'll continue to, that's part of who we are. It's one of our many intersecting identities. And um, so we have that experience and then we have the experience of writing about characters who have mental health issues and also talking to kids, you know, who read our books and, and give us that feedback. Having said all that, we are not professionals. We are not in any way qualified to diagnose, to, um, give advice other than in general like this is what works for us with self-care um so that is that's what's up that's it yeah. and we have a a resource um that we included in the the um, registration page that is also available um here um that has resources for anybody who needs them so these resources are available if you really do have serious issues that you deserve attention for right now that need to be addressed and then when this um, webinar becomes available to anyone who couldn't make it um, the links are on there if you need them so i'm going to go ahead and put that there and then pull it down okay so that being said can i can i intro you now can i you want to intro me first Okay. Yeah. Um, you have already gone off the agenda. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I knew that would take all of 30 minutes. No, no, no. You can be all master of the agenda. Okay. I'm just the flurry of ideas and they just, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. So, so this, this fabulous human is, is Alex Alexandra and her debut, um, The Grief Keeper, which is behind 
her, if you move your head a little bit, um, yes, was an Indies Next Introduce and a Fall 2019 Junior Library Guild selection, something I aspire to at some point in my lifetime. The Grief Keeper was also on the ALA Rainbow List uh, book list 2020 and the was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, which is immense. Congratulations. Thank you. I cannot tell you how honored I am about that. It is huge for me. You need a banner. I would wear a banner. I, I may I may have to get some construction paper and make myself a tiara or something that says can, we, can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and here's the thing I want to mention with that with anybody who's listening now or in the future. That, that that's an, a monumental accomplishment. But I think that when you make accomplishments that mean something to you, oh. even if perhaps it isn't Lambda, and I said it with all respect, that's wow. But I think that you need to capture those and keep those. I've told um, my husband, for example, to when these little emails come in to him, complimenting him on what he's doing right now with the pandemic and the educational system. He's under a tremendous amount of stress and he is coping with so many issues. Um, I tell him to keep them. So just mm -hmm. to anyone who's listening out there, whatever accomplishments that you have, um, if it's an email, if it's something that someone tweeted you, if it's something from Instagram that someone said to you, if it's something that someone texted to you, like for example, a few minutes ago, Alex sent a thing to me via text that reassured me that my mistakes, I don't have to like spend all day, you know, because I cycle on them, like keep that and keep it when you need it and, and remind you and to remind yourself. So I would say right there is, is a strategy to help you yes. in your, in your processes. It, especially for writers, because mm -hmm. we are subject, no matter where you are, I know I'm skipping, now I'm skipping around the agenda. Anyway, wherever you are on your uh, journey as a writer, pre-publication, post-publication, just starting out, you are going to go through a whole barrage of uh, information about yourself that is going to knock you down one way or the other or lift you up. And you really have to be the person in control of how you let that affect you. And if you know that you have mental health issues and you know that things can make you spiral or put you in a place that you don't want to be right now or that you're not, you don't have the resources right now to be in that place. There's nothing wrong with saving some critique or some, you know, or, or even just being like, I don't have to look at that today. I don't have to look at that ever. Really just managing, that's part of managing your mental health, just like you manage your physical health, it is to uh, be very aware of what you let in and when you let it in and I say this to myself, I say it to my kids, particularly who also struggle, you know, uh, your brain is going to give much more weight to the negative mm -hmm. than to the positive. So you need to make up the difference. That is an evolutionary thing. It's, it's based on, you know, the lizard part of our brain that tells us about danger. And that's why, that's why we, we get a nice email that is totally complimentary and really should make us feel wonderful. That weighs about as much as a feather compared to a mediocre Goodreads review, which is like a ton of lead. And, and they should- Excuse me, I'm going to interrupt you because I just want to suggest, and this is not me, I have to give credit to uh, the lovely Musa Mia. <laughs> if you want to protect your mental health as a post-publication writer. When you do look at Goodreads, I will not merely say don't look because we look. We look. Time Time when you're looking. This is what I did to mm -hmm. modify because I do look and you look too. Mm -hmm. um, don't look right before you're starting to work on your manuscript. Don't do that. Here's why. Because sometimes what's there is like, oh, yes, this is why I do what I do, which happened to me just recently. And then other times it's like, why am I doing this? You know, like to, you know, just so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm always going to look. When you're dealing with your critiques, whether it's from your group, make sure you're actually in a better place. Time when you're doing it, if you can't, um, if, because we can't avoid critiques, but with things like Goodreads, for example, for the people who are published, just make it so that you have a, you're talking with your your people afterwards, or it's yeah. not people starting a manuscript that you're struggling on. So that's my newest coping strategy since I can't stop yeah. reading those I think things. that's I think that's super smart. Okay, um, so before we get too far off, the topic. Let me introduce Nonika Ramos, 
who is amazing, as you probably already know, but a little bit about her. Lilian Rivera, author of Dealing in Dreams, who we stand, we stand, yes. uh, selected Anoni's most recent book, The Truth Is, as a bustle book club selection. Hey, Platina named The Truth Is as one of 10 of the best Latinx young adult books of 2019. Remezcla included, the truth is, in 15 best books by Latino and Latin American authors of 2019. And that is just a small sampling of the rave reviews that this amazing book has received. So I am a huge fan. I love this book. That's it. I love you, Alex. So uh, again, we just want to let everyone know and remind that there is a chat box and, and please feel free to introduce yourself and just shout out where you're from. Um, also, um, feel free to share, um, like we're going to share how you're taking care of you. Um, <clears throat> so and maybe Alex and I can take a few minutes to kind of talk about what what's working for us, what has worked as far as self-care, especially in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and then please chime in with what you're doing. But I want to start off with Alex's magnificence because I got some mail, Alex. I'm speaking about self-care and, and how we're all coping with being parents and now educators for those of us who are homeschooling and pub publicists for ourselves. And now that we're having to, you know, organize our own fests and webinars um, and all the things. And then this, I was explain the chicken. There. Got it. Woo! This came from Alex in the mail, and, and my Langston was so excited, and, and my mommy, they were like so thrilled. Yay. <laughs> I, my, I sent you worms. I sent you literal worms. <laughs> yeah, so my point being, like, why am I excited about meal worms coming in the mail? My coping mechanism, I'll start, has been to. I'm going to be raising chickens, and so, and I am excited, and we, the kids and I are excited. So um, I went to Alex for expertise on how to do this because Alex has raised chickens before. I have. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, like the care of other uh, creatures can be stressful, whether they're chickens or children um, or anything, any any pet can be stressful, a cause of stress, but also um, in the right frame of mind and with the right resources, they really can be something, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of, um, a lot of mental health issues are exacerbated by not having routine or by being pulled into many direction, different directions, which is what our brain does when it's not working the way it should. So um, one of the things that routine like having chickens is it's very regular. You get up, you feed them at the right time because they're there waiting for you like, hello. Um, you need to collect the eggs. You need to do all these things. And it's like, it's, it's soothing in a way that I feel like, um, it's just so good right now because you're you feel like it's something positive. You're making something. You're not making the eggs, but you know what I mean. You're growing and and, and shepherding uh, another you know human being, human not beings. No, chickens are not human beings. Uh, another life form. Uh, and it's and it's wonderful. You're gonna have the best time. Yeah, I think I I, I yeah I'm focusing on what you said about routine. And I'm thinking about anyone out there listening whose routines have been completely disrupted. And I know that, that the answer to that might be, well, everybody's routines are disrupted, but I kind of want to focus on those of us who struggle with mental health issues or mental illness. Um, yeah. Many of us, I'll, I'll just speak to myself. We create routines also partially to boost our mental health. So we may, I, I, for example, would get up at 4.45 to work out in the morning, not because I'm a narcissistic person, but because one, it keeps my physical health intact as someone who has experienced um, <clears throat> and recovered from cancer, but also my mental health, because if I start off that way, whatever cycling is going through in my mind, um, I can work out <clears throat> in the beginning of the day. You know, and so a lot of us out there have have constructed things to help them already. And then the pandemic came. And so that's not happening because if I don't write in the morning, I don't write at all. So for me, I have to. So I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about um, what you said about routine and how we need to reconstruct our routines, not just because we're forced to, but also because we have to reconfigure how do we keep our mental health where it needs to be with all this mess. Oop, I just lost your volume. I can't hear you. 
hello, I did that. That was me. Sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm a professional, I swear. Okay. Um, I think that one of the things that is difficult when you have um, mental health issues, uh, a lot of things are more difficult and you have to work, find coping mechanisms. But one of the things is uh, pivoting, you know, like really being like, oh, I was, I had my, my, my flow and I do, knew what I was supposed to be doing and what I need to take care of myself. And then the, literally the entire world changes all the rules on you. And that is something that is really hard for anybody. And then also somebody who is struggling with mental illness, it is harder. And what we're going to talk about further into the conversation is that every layer of marginalization that you put on top of that. So if you are um, a uh, from a marginalized background, your LGBTQ youth, those add layers of difficulty so that the pivoting and the self-care becomes even harder and more onerous. So that's one thing we're gonna talk about later, but yeah, the pivot and the, the fact that everyone is in the same boat, which could be like, well, at least I'm not alone. You know that your problems are very different from other people who don't have mental health issues. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm looking and I, forgive me because I just moved back to the chat. I'm also a professional, yay. <laughs> I wanted to say hi to Francesca and Mari and I wanted to say hi to Sheila and much love and and forgive me if I mispronounce Megan. Okay, and and I just, <clears throat> speaking about what you're, there's, we're never all, I said this in the last webinar, standing in the same place, really, because even as ourselves as individuals, because we bring something new to every move that we make, every 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 time that we proceed forward. And even though there's, we're still all in this, I see it as the ocean we're all in, but what we're, some of us are walking on water right now. I, you know, and, and some of us are, are actually saying, this is time for me and my family that we never had. These are real responses from people. And sure. now because of this, we've, had a rocky start, but now as a family, this is this is what's happening. And then there are those of us who are drowning, and there are those of us who are are are, are float. I mean, there's just so to me, I see that ocean. We're all in the same ocean of what's going on. But um, yeah, I was thinking about um, Verdad when you were talking because in the truth is, she wishes the world would shut down. She's like, I can't handle all the the, the, the yeah. stimulus, all the expectations on me. The, the, and, and so now I'm thinking, what would Verdad be thinking in a world where the world really did shut down? You mm -hmm. know, this, and it made me come to the point of thinking, I, I, I her, her mother is a healthcare worker. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Her mother is a healthcare worker. I would see her sitting, her. Um, her sitting there in there in the room and contemplating just terror of knowing that the parent is going out into that into that world and that and and as I feel with my own dad who's out in that world as a healthcare yeah. worker. Yeah. Um, but I think we can back up just a little bit because I want to um, have look. You you're the master of the ceremony. Yeah. So <laughs> no one will be surprised. We are already off schedule. Okay. So we are uh, some of the, so you talked about some of the self care that you do and getting chickens is one of the things that I feel like is great. Uh, one thing that I do for self care really is uh, I walk and I'm lucky because I live in a, a fairly rural part of Pennsylvania. So I walk in nature. I make sure no matter what the weather is, pouring rain, you know, beautiful sunshine like it is here today. I make sure that I walk in nature. It doesn't have to be far. It's not, I don't run in nature, girl, no. But <laughs> let's not, you know. But I do walk in nature and um, my friend, uh, James Brandon, who wrote Ziggy Stardust and Me is a wonderful book. Um, often like will send me pictures of places he's, he lives in California. Uh, places where he's been and meditations that he's done and somebody who is so in touch with nature and um, with that, that sort of like um, that sort of healing part of nature inspires me to seek that out too. It's something that if you're lucky enough to be near a piece of nature, it doesn't have to be huge. It can just be the sky. I feel like being connecting in nature is something that I, even when I don't have time, even if I don't want to, even if I'm tired, it never fails to to increase the a little bit of my sort of mental health resources. Yeah, and when you and and also when you were talking, I I, <laughs> I completely blocked out these other things. You know, before this pan pandemic happened, 
I was feeling this sense of, of loss and, and looking up the Bronx a whole lot. <clears throat> and I and, I'm, and kind of doing research on this, that, and the other. And one thing that I've come back to that has preserved my, my family's mental health in this time has been reconnecting with the Bronx and, and Brooklyn virtually. So I wanna like this, this yeah, this, you know, webinar is sponsored by, but um, Jazzy Flow BX, like Bronx, Jazzy Flow Bronx, um, is on Instagram. And I and I found uh, this person and they are a New Yorican who does does yoga. Oh, and, awesome. Yeah. So so Jandi and I took a, a virtual class on there and I was like sitting there connecting with this person on my carpet. And I'm like, your child. Yes. Nobody knows. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. My uh, <clears throat> correct. My child. My yes. I. In case people were like, "Is she doing yoga with her cat?" Like, no. Actually, my cat did show up in the. Oh, yeah? yoga, but specifically, J Jazzy Flow was the instructor, and and J Jandi, my child, and I were doing the and the cat <laughs> were doing oh, yeah. the yoga, and then we found something called. Um, Kiere Wellness, where Langston and I are doing African drumming. We're using oh a God, so for real. I love that. And then Boogie Down Books. I made this list before we started. I'm like, we can sit at story time mm -hmm. and be in the Bronx and be listening to story time. So those were some things that we found that we never would have been able to do in the previous circumstances mm -hmm. that yeah. we've been able to get back to the Bronx. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good. So, which is a great segue for one of the ways that when we write about uh, teens, one of the ways that they are able to connect or really like uncover their identity, like really like the way that Verdad and Marisol and other people in our books find their identity is through community. So one of the things that makes it so difficult right now, we can do it online. We are adults most of the time. We can like find ways, but for kids it is, uh, it can be isolating this time to not be able to be with your community, especially if you're not out yet and you uh, your community is like one or two people who you're close to at school or somewhere else that you go and you're cut off from them and you are really like effectively like that part of your identity is not being nurtured, uh, especially when you have, you know, uh, intersecting identities. You need that connection. You need to find that connection. And one of the places you can find it, which is completely just like, you know, like it's just it's contained. It's just this is books, is our books and other people's books, which we will mention later on, some book recommendations that deal with LGBTQ uh, issues and mental health issues and those intersections. Um, but I think that that is something that worries me. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm gonna, if you don't mind me looking in a weird direction, I was doing some research for this webinar and I found a link from the Trevor Project on some research that they just recently did on COVID-19 um, quarantine and the effect that it's having on LGBTQ youth. So um, I'm just gonna find that real fast and I'm gonna post the uh, link in the chat box. So give me one second. Talk amongst yourselves or whatever, you know. Um, chat, chat, chat. Yeah, Sometimes after I really that, go yeah. back to hearing your, a little bit of a reading from the both of us to bring it back home. The isolation that, um, teens and particularly LGBTQIA plus teens feel was already being experienced before this pandemic because there's such a limitation on community. And Alex and I were talking about how that the limitation is as such. We start address, start, begin, scratch the surface of their needs in high school. So we are ident equating being LGBTQI with being sexual before you're supposed to be developmentally sexual. And because of that, we're limiting all the resources, all of the community, all of the access to windows, mirrors, and doors that these LGBTQI kids need even more. Yeah. And, and so because we're saying you need to wait to, to figure yourself out and to understand yourself and to find community until you're 14 or 15 years old, which we have no expectation of that of any other human being. So, um, and also it had, gives, I mean, for people who are not LGBTQ and sort of looking in, it gives this false idea of the, about that identity, identity being purely sexualized, which is it, it, incorrect. But, you know, I have come across 
grown ass adults in my community who are like, well, I can't let my child read that book because it's not appropriate for this age. And I'm like, that book is 100% appropriate for that age. It talks about love. You have been, we talked about this yesterday, you have been indoctrinating your children with a heteronormative uh, storyline since Disney first popped up on your TV screen when they were like a year old. So you need to tell me that that's not, that that's, that's, a, that's appropriate, but this isn't. And so there's really like, it's either a willful misunderstanding of what it means to be LGBTQ or it's some bullshit, sorry. But you know, like, I, I, feel, I really feel like, so again, what we talked about when we were talking ranting, <laughs> maybe we were ranting, what we were ranting about yesterday was how um, it's great to see a lot of YA books and we're starting to see a lot of middle grade books and picture books. And that is really what makes me so excited because that's, you need all of that representation and all of that validation of your intersecting identities from the get go. You need it as a child from the get go. And, and it's still being resisted. And here's an example. I have a picture book and illustrations are being worked on. And I, and this, and I've not given up, <laughs> but my original, there's a split Wait, is it where I've read. Um, it, it's hair. It's, it's hair. Oh, okay. okay. And gonna... yeah. And the illustrations are that I intended with, with what I wrote were the two moms holding hands mm -hmm. and the kids holding hands and, and it instantly, and the illustrations came back with the two kids holding hands, but not the moms. And and it started off with I, me clearly communicating: they're not just friends. The okay. moms, they're not just friends. It's not. It doesn't have to be a romantic book, but they are together. So can we not just have them hold hands? Just as a subtle, the book doesn't have to be about being gay to have gayness in it, because it doesn't have to be about any heterosexuality to have people being heterosexual. So, Charles, to answer your question about that noise, my kids are watering things, ah, moving back. <laughs> ah, so anyway, um, so yeah, so the point being that um, we create and isolate when we don't give kids access to each other, and this pandemic is compounding that, but we also do it when we don't allow gayness to be normal and just be part of things. Um, yeah you know, that don't have, they don't scream, this is LGBT, as, as just like all the other books don't say, this is heterosexual. It's just yeah, huge. This is it's just huge. This is white. Exactly. So there's erasure is, is something that happens at, well, as um, we're probably speaking to the choir here, but the, <laughs> the erasure happens in a variety of ways, some intentional and ugly and some unintentional. Yeah. Um, but um, Alex, I want to bring it back because I want you to. Are you reading today? I am. I, Could you please, and whilst you read for a moment, I'm going to please go. Uh, please beg my family to quit watering the garden. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so this is my book, The Grief Keeper. It is uh, basically about um, two sisters, um, Marisol and Gabby, who come from El Salvador. They leave their country because of the violence there, and they come to the United States, and they are immediately um, uh, put into de a detention center uh, where they are given an unusual choice. If Gabby, if uh, Mar Marisol participates in a uh, scientific trial for a device that transfers grief from one person to another, they have a chance of having reaching asylum. So um, Marisol agrees to this. And um, at this point is sort of towards the middle end of the, um, of the book and it's very short, um, but it is basically during the trial, Marisol is absorbing the grief of um, the other person, Ray, um, and Ray, uh, she doesn't know that Marisol is absorbing her grief. So um, this is sort of what a little snapshot of uh, Marisol's day when she is uh, experiencing not only her own trauma that sort of no one knows about, but somebody else's, you know, uh, burden on top of them. <clears throat> and Indrani is one of the people who has sort of um, uh, pulled Marisol and Gabby into this uh, experiment. Indrani gives me three pills for the morning. She'll leave tonight's pills with Ray, who will make sure I take them. 
all these people taking care of me, making things as easy for me as possible. These are the same people giving me all this pain. Manny makes me walk around the reflecting pool with him once a day. We don't talk. Thank God he doesn't make me talk. I don't know if I would vomit up a mass of bloody broken words or if I would be terrified by how little I could say. He only makes me move my body to get some of the stiffness out of it. It is the only part of my day that I look forward to without any mixed feelings because the only thing I have to do is walk. Manny occasionally tells me the names of plants. I listen or I don't. It makes no difference to him. Sometimes he puts his hand on my shoulder and I flinch. I can't help it. My first thought is always that a touch is going to hurt, but his touch doesn't hurt the way Ray's does. I haven't told anyone about the touching, how being skin to skin with Ray transmits her grief and sadness right into my body as if they were my own. If grief and sadness, excuse me, if Andrani knew, she'd stop the experiment. An hour before school ends, I eat something, then take a shower and brush my teeth. Olga helps me because she and Andrani are afraid to leave me in the bathroom by myself too long. They don't trust me behind a closed door. Now I understand how Ray felt being watched all the time. When Olga leaves, I sit, my hair combed back, my thin face a mystery to me, practicing my smile in the mirror on Ray's desk. I smile it until it seems almost natural, almost genuine. Performing for Gabby is the hardest part of my day. She knows I'm sad because of the experiment and that's my job to make Ray feel better, but I can't let her see how much I'm hurting. So really I wanted to not only explore what it feels like when you have depression and are in the throes of a, of a depressive episode, but also how much we put on ourselves and other people put on, our, our, on us this expectation to perform, to smile, to seem okay, to just tick boxes so that people can go, oh, okay, and pass by. So it's not just what you feel, but also what you what you feel compelled to do for others and in, in society. And I, I was so moved to read about the empathy that was created, because even though we, of course, don't want Marisol being experimented upon, because that's, you know, as far as people of color, indigenous people, that has truly happened, okay, where, as, as you have, as you have said in, in our previous conversations, you know, this is not something that's really science fiction, you know, this is actually reality where we have our people of color, our, our, our immigrants, our marginalized persons treat treated, dehumanized, and 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 um, in experiments where they've even been sterilized. I mean, oh, all sorts of atrocities. It's happened in Puerto Rico. It's happened in, in, yeah. to indigenous yeah. people. It's happened, yes, absolutely. And and exactly. So I want to point out that, first of all, that's real. Yeah. But the part that, that I, I spoke to me as far as the issue of mental illness is so often when we're going going through it or, or we're connecting with someone who is, it's extremely hard to truly understand there's nothing glamorous about it. I think that TV and movies constantly glamorize and sexualize and beautify oh, what it looks like. Yeah. Depression is, is it, it makes you feel like you're irritating to other people and it irritates other people because they don't understand the chemical nature. They don't understand the reality of, of what's going on physically in your body. They, they, they don't understand the connection between mind body. So I, I just, I thought for a minute, let me, what would that feel like if I were trying to uh, connect with someone that I wasn't connected with that was going through something mm -hmm. and trying to feel in my skin what they're feeling rather than judging what I think it's supposed to mean. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was an immense amount of work that you communicated in the mental health community about really understanding that she can't, I remember the scene where she can't swallow very well, you know, and, and it's hard to breathe. Yeah. And that's, not, that's not psychosomatic. Your no, no. body does go into that, you know, right. So, and one of the things that I think, I mean, you do this really well in the truth is as well, is that there is a wide breadth of experience of what happens when you are going through depression, post traumatic stress disorder, all these things and the effects on the body of trauma, not on just only on the psyche, but on the body, which are connected, like you said, um, are so sort of underrepresented in a realistic way in a lot of media that I have had teenagers read my book and say, how did you know? 
Mm -hmm. I've never seen this before. How did you know that this is how I felt? And I'm like, a lot of people feel this. You don't see it, maybe. It's not on, like, you know, a lot of TV. It's sort of like, if it's represented, it's represented in, in one aspect or one, you know, or sort of, like, hushed away. Um, it's, it's so it's, wide. It's so frustrating, too, because I listen to, uh, has a Gen X person kind of reflect hey. on some of the <laughs> that used to be on the radio about, but these were definitely women centered where the rock star would talk about the woman with the running eyeliner. And yeah, you know, that and was all, yeah, like, it's just uh, having yeah. gone through the experience. I'm like, you get, I, you get, uh, speaking of isolation, you feel isolated. You, you, and, and people isolate you because even though they offer help for anyone out there who's go, who has gone or is going through a thing, people offer help, but they don't really know what they're offering. They don't really know how to give it. How do we really help someone who's going through these things? It's so complicated. Um, yeah. But as far as like your, your um, Verdad and um, the, the coping mechanisms in there, Verdad is dealing with, with death and with grief and with losing a best friend. And 100%. Yeah, and so with, with grief, I was thinking about something that connects us both our characters, um, you know, Verdad has lost Blanca. It was a racially, you know, motivated shooting. Verdad is coming to school. Our kids come to school like this. You know, our kids come to our education systems with all these seemingly very adult things, but it's just that we have adult coping mechanisms. They're coming with the same issues of, of pain mm -hmm. and they're having to sit in the classroom and they're having to somehow learn and process when their brain and their hearts and their souls haven't healed. And so her dad is sitting in the classroom and coping. And one of the ways we were talking about that, that they're coping is through, you know, not letting go of Blanca and cons and, and almost treating them like a real entity and speaking to them as if they were in the past, you know, and, and having this constant dialogue because grief is isolation in itself. You know, people can be close to each other in it, but there's still this veil that comes through because you it, it's it's very lonely when you hurt that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's grief is absolutely an isolating uh, experience. I don't I don't actually this is me just spitballing here, but I don't actually think that it can ever be anything but an isolated. I, I, you can connect with people, you can help people, you can be helped, but your grief is yours and only yours. And so that's kind of in, in my book, the ridiculousness of trying to burden someone, you know, like to offset your grief to somebody else to burden what we talked about, the emotional and the physical labor that we expect of migrants. Um, it's sort of ridiculous because your grief is yours. You can only experience it through your lens. There's no one else can experience it the same exact way. Um, for all the things that make you who you are, that is what your grief is made up of. Your you and what's happening to you. So um, it's really it's really difficult to connect with people. And when I when I read the truth is, which is such a one of the things. I mean, should you want to do your reading first? You should do your reading first, and then we'll talk about mine. This is super short because I thought mine was short, but no, I think my yours will be even shorter. Well, here's why. So in, in my book, it's told from the first person perspective of her dad. Um, again, she's dealing with this grief. She's interacting with the ghost of Blanca. And to me, um, while I say that this is a mental health coping mechanism, I actually treat Blanca and feel as the writer that she was, she was actually physically there. because oh, I don't she's see, the third point of view in my mind. I, I don't see, I, and I wrote it that way intentionally. I've never seen Blanca as completely fictional. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think that there I is something that. after whatever you want to label it. So, yeah, but... But so Verda communicates with Blanca's ghost throughout. But when Blanca is grieving, Blanca, um, you know, is also just a normal teenager and, uh, uh, and on the, in the sense of having needs for, for love and friendship and interaction and community and and um, and sees Danny and sees trans boy Danny. And and just there's no explanation, just feels an attraction because in, in a moment, Danny shows empathy towards her dad. Mm -hmm. in a way that hasn't been shown to Verdad in, in this experience she's having. And so, of course, Verdad is drawn to that. Yeah. And so in, in, in feeling attracted to Danny, that's where Verdad questions um, who they are, you know, um, just as far as um, their, their 
their gender identity, their sexual identity. They were already struggling who they were as, as, a, as a Boricua, being someone who's not first generation and, and where, their, where their place is in that. So, um, so I, I, instead of reading from The Truth Is, which a couple of people on here um, have heard a little piece, I wanted to, to write a little tiny piece from Danny's perspective, which I, I did not do my book in, out of respect because I am not trans. And I, I personally believe that only trans persons should write first person trans stories, in my opinion, in respect to the lack of voices that are out there to begin with and the struggle that we're having, having everyone heard. So my story is from Verdad's perspective. But in this part of the book, um, Verdad is playing violin and Verdad is very, very cut off from, you know, uh, their own emotions in that um, they can't ex they can't express their grief. They, the Latinx community and the community that that Verdad is experiencing in the book doesn't really address mental health and doesn't really validate any issues with mental health. And we can get into that. And so um, Verdad, I have opinions. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Verdad has Verdad has those feelings. Verdad plays violin one night, and that's that's how they're expressing. Um, everything that, that, that's going on that they can't articulate. So Danny walks in in this, and this is um, Danny speaking in my little paragraph here. <laughs> so forgive the roughness, I wrote it last night. I think it's beautiful. I so it. my name is Danny, pronouns he, him. I didn't go to the school that night to listen to her dad play violin, but standing up there on the stage, she stood apart from the rest. I knew that look. Maybe we're all standing in the same place, but some of us walked through fire to get there. She had a halo of embers and an aura of smoke. For one second, I wasn't hearing my stomach growl. I was hearing music and the way she played violin that night, I knew all the words. I wasn't scared because I was alone. I was scared because I didn't want to be when I looked at her. After the recital, her dad caught me rattling around the janitor's closet. Truth be told, I wasn't there that night for her. School events were my chance to get back inside the school building, use a toilet, wash my hands and face, pry tampons out of the dispenser for Prisha and Priya. For me, guys have periods too. For our first anniversary, she gave me toilet paper roll art. I gave her toilet paper roses. When the pandemic hit, I saw this meme of these violinists playing in empty toilet paper aisles. I don't know if you've seen it. I texted her dad. For a minute, I was like, were people feeling like we had felt? No, she said, because they were grown. They faced the apocalypse of everything they had known and trusted as adults. We were kids. Mm. And so Beautiful. I just, when this pandemic hit and every one of us was scrambling in our own ways for resources, these kids, these LGBT, these kids are doing that every day. They're yeah. doing it every day. Even if they're in a healthy household where they're loved, they're still scrambling for resources because the world has isolated them from, from mainstream validation and acceptance and love. So even your healthiest person with people who accept them, it, there's, that's, the, that's the travesty of the society we live in, that they're yeah. going out into the world with this, these issues. And I do want to mention with the pronouns, <laughs> where that starts off as, she, her in it, and it isn't till the very end. So if you're hearing a pronoun switch, mm -hmm. it, there's a transition there. Um, just out of respect for anyone who's listening with that, I am working on that issue as Alex knows. <laughs> yeah, as we all are, as, as all of us are. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's so beautiful. I love, I, I mean, I know, I understand what you're saying about not wanting to write from the trans perspective first person, but I love hearing his voice i love hearing from him what what he was experiencing that night which is this pivotal moment um it's really beautiful um the whole book is beautiful <laughs> uh, but i also i one of the things i love about about this book is how uh verdad's voice is so unique and it jumps off the page and it really just like grabs you and it's like you can't like you cannot deny their uh, their personhood, the you know who who they are, um, and I think that they also manage to put um, humor in everything, like in a way that they're you know, and that's something that again we're talking about, sort of like um, not 
wonderful representation of mental health issues is there is humor, there is love. Somebody, I remember, I know you said not to read Goodreads or we should <laughs> not to read, but I remember somebody writing on a, my Goodreads somewhere was like, well, if she's so depressed, like how can she fall in love? I'm like, mm, not mutually exclusive. None of this is mutually exclusive. You can be queer, you can be Latinx, you can be you know, non-binary, you can fall in love, you can fall out of love, you can trust because you fell in love and weren't requited. That's the most ridiculous recruit. I mean, but it was, it was kind of like, I'm not, I'm not even mad. I just don't understand what your life is like, you know? Like, are you so, like, privileged that you, you're right. in order? Like, what do you do? Order them up and be like, first I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to have a breakdown. Like, I don't get it. Oh, what you're saying is so important because that's the whole thing about intersectionality. We don't get to do every road separately. They're all going at once. And those multiple oppressions that are happening to these children yeah. who ourselves or for, for the fact that we have adults in the room, our, our own children. I mean, yeah. let's also talk yeah. about that, our own children, yeah. if we're trying to prepare them for this world that we're in. Yeah. Uh, we have to take account of all all of those things. There's no uh, there's no right answer to how to feel when your body has completely shut down. And I also speaking of Goodreads, I I, I do remember somebody saying something like the person that their depression is irritating. I'm like, oh, it's irritating. It's it is irritating. That is what depression is. What not, it is. Yes, it's not. It's not. Um, anyway, but I do want to touch on something else, which I I just. The Latinx mental health, which you and I talked about today, and speaking of, of us as those people and everyone out there now and in the future who might look at this, it's dangerous when we don't address mental health. It's dangerous. And it's one of those things that, like, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot. Listen, we always say this, uh, Latinidad is not a monolith. It's like, whoosh, right? We had a Las Musas retreat not that long ago, and we got to see where we all come from and who, where we all are and all our intersecting identities is beautiful. But uh, one of the things, like, and, and my parents are immigrants, uh, and I feel like, especially for, like, first gen or second gen, like, when, when sort of you have this kind of myth of the old country, I kind of got a lot of messages of, like, oh, mental health issues that's an american thing we don't do that that must be some like american nonsense that you picked up same thing with being queer that must be some sort of american newfangled thing as if you know we didn't have tios tias cousins you know everybody it, talk about erasure in your own family history so i feel like that's that's one of those things that and it's not only in our our cultures but in a lot of marginalized cultures it's as if it doesn't exist. So you could make the mistake as a teen who has these identities that you're the only one. Yes. And I just, first of all, I, you and I were talking. We did this whole seminar yesterday. Yeah, and, and we had a blast. <laughs> we watched a lot more. Yes. This is, a, yeah, this is part, this is part two. <laughs> but um, the, um, this idea, we honor our, our parents, those who have come before us for the struggles that they have gone through. We were talking about how, you know, I'm never going to understand what, what my, my father ha has gone through. And he makes it so hard because he doesn't speak a lot about it. And I have to pull it out, you know, and, and, and so and I'll never understand, you know, my, my, my great grandmother went through, you know, coming here and, and being isolated and not having anyone to talk to. You know, but um, I only years later realized I'm like, oh, my God, this depression started with her. And she started it because she she was she should she would disappear on buses all day. And I realized I'm like, that's because she was looking for some kind of community and going to those shops and speaking to people in her native language and connecting. She wasn't really she was disappearing from us, but she was reclaiming herself in those little exchanges. Yeah, trying to. Yeah. I don't get that. I don't get what it's like to 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 do any of those things to work that hard. I will never get that. So I understand why our people said, I don't have time, okay, for sadness. I don't have time for grief. You will not be fed if if I ha right. if I take the time to deal with my mental health. Right. You know, like I I so I want to put that there. But at the same time, we all now coming into this, right? Like you and, and me, we have to make that time, even with whatever we're going through. I just had that dis discussion with my child, Jandi, 
yesterday about, I'm sorry I bring so much into our relationship sometimes that you, that I can't explain to you because they don't know what I'm bringing in to our relationship because I haven't created, our world isn't like that for my child. Mm -hmm. You know, but I doesn't mean I can't. I, I don't acknowledge and, and shouldn't acknowledge what you're experiencing right now. So, um, so just kind of like not only talking about our books, but also ourselves and the expectations that we have to have of ourselves in, in the not monolithic. Thank you for community. We're not addressing mental health. We really aren't. And and the fact that our Latinx and our children of color and our LGBT people, you know. All of these 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 children, they need us because if they don't have someone to address it, we're going to lose them, and we are losing them. And statistically, the Trevor Center, Trevor Project. I mean, if, if I can just pop in here for the few, the people who are here, if you have a spare cash and you can send it to Trevor Project, um, who does amazing work uh, with youth and in really who are at risk youth, um, LGBTQ youth. Um, also, uh, Lambda Literary that really works to lift up LGBTQ works of literature and bringing out to a greater audience. These are like my three things. And then this dude right here in Las, in Las Titas, sorry, um, Immigration Equality is a nonprofit that actually helps LGBTQ uh, asylum seekers to this country with their legal uh, problems. So listen, we're all tight for cash. I get it. But five bucks here, five bucks there. Don't order Starbucks online that day like me. Um, okay, I'm done. That was my PSA. Yes. Alex, would you like me to do the meditation so that we have some time for questions before people start dropping off? Only if you do not kill me because I forgot my candle. So we're going to use your candle. I got it. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I see the time. Um, I feel like we, we could, I could spend hours just on Alex's book. <laughs> Same, same. The respect is deep, man. So I just, but I'm going to go into the meditation. And if you want to join um, in any way that you feel comfortable, um, I do have a candle and I have my wand. Um, so I'm going to read. Please join in. I, I am a believer in energy. It doesn't matter if we're not in the same space. Um, I it, it, This is, um, you know, it, it, whatever spirituality that, that is what you ascribe to, um, <clears throat> bring that with you. <laughs> so I'm going to start. Um, and if you forgive me for one second, because this screen is not on the right space. Okay, so I've got the candle lit. And if we could just all take a minute. We light this candle for every human being who has lost their lives to the coronavirus for the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being of every human being who has lost someone to this virus, for everyone who is battling the virus as we speak, and for those at their bedside nursing and praying them to wellness. We light this candle for every human being who has lost their livelihood, for every person whose visions, plans, hopes, and dreams have been deferred, for everyone whose routines and schedules have been disrupted, whose confidence has been dissolved, whose futures have been filled with question marks. We light this candle for all our essential workers, particularly those who bear the weight, brunt, and burden of this pandemic, the marginalized people of color who have truly kept this country running, who have stood on the front lines of this battle of, against corona, that these heroes may be recognized, protected, and paid that in honoring them as heroes, we don't forget their humanity and their need for healing, catharsis, and rest. We pray for our immigrants during this time who are still criminalized and caged, compounding every suffering they have already experienced. For our at-risk children who now do not have schools as a refuge and a resource for counseling and meals. For our inner city youth who already underserved now have absolutely no job options, no rec centers, no camps, no programs. For our LGBTQIA and homeless children who are having the few shelters available to them and the few resources they had closed. Mm -hmm. Finally, we light this candle for creators. May we be reminded that in creating in all its forms as educators, writers, artists, dancers, engineers, whatever way it is that you're making, that creation is the antithesis and antidote to destruction, corruption, and despair. 
that creating is not just about a product, but your process. Mm -hmm. Coming together as community, we create indestructible energy, a resounding yawp and openness to infinite possibility. So I have to breathe. It's making me upset. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, a lot of the, a lot, I mean, you covered so many important things. Um, my sister, Ana Mari, is a, a nurse in New York City. Um, she continues to go into New York City every day. I continue to text her many times a day, asking her if she's okay, worried about her. Um, and that is only one small um, piece of the people that we, you know, send our our best hopes and wishes and you know heart to and 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 keeping that in keeping those people and the people who uh, continue to be marginalized in the ways that you talked about uh, in our hearts and minds when we write I think is really important I mean I don't know what your process is but like when I get a shiny new idea I'm so like sh excited by the shiny idea I'm like shut my legs yeah. hi baby <laughs> That boy. This is Hi. I say it's Miss Alex. Hi, Langston. How you doing? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I see how it be. All right. Um, so we only have five minutes left. Uh, I was gonna give some book recommendations that cover sort of the topics that we were talking about. Please feel free to jump in. You too, Langston, any of your favorite books. Um, so some of them I'm sure you are uh aware of a lot of them, but I think that they're sort of seminal. Um, Juliet Takes a Breath by Gabby Rivera. Uh, wonderful, just touches on all the things we talked about, identity, intersecting identities, um, LGBTQ issues, um, community, true community, false community. Um, also, Aristotle and Dante Discover the Universe. I love that book. Uh, Benjamin Allaire's Science, I hope I said that right. Um, Gabby, A Girl in Pieces by Isabel Quintero. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. We, I mean, we did this. We basically did this webinar yesterday with more cursing. Um, and then a book. Those are all young adult books. Uh, there is one book that I have not read yet but really interests me. Uh, it's called Tears of the Truffle Pig by Fernando Flores. And um, it's a sort of a, a slightly sci-fi or speculative fiction take on the border. Um, so that sounds really interesting to me if you wanna check it out as well. And then because we talked about this before about how important it is to get representative books in middle school and earlier, I've got some middle school recommendations. Um, the Whispers by Greg Howard is wonderful. My absolute favorite. LGBTQ um, middle grade book is Hurricane Child by Case and Calendar. Mm -hmm. That book is, a, to me, a masterpiece. I, I adore it. Um, they have a new book. Uh, I think it's out already called King and the Dragonflies, which is also, I, I haven't read it yet, but I have a copy. It's, mm, you've read it? Yes, I have. Case oh. is a, a, like a virtuoso. He, they are so able to write beautiful stories in so many like categories in middle grade and young adult. They have a, a series, uh, Queen of the Conquered is the first book of adult fantasy. I, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. Mm -mm. Um, also, there is another book called Hurricane Season that I want to read by Nicole Malaby. And a book that I have, I told you I have it in my bathroom, so everybody in the family, all the kids can check it out. Uh, it's called This Book is Gay by Juno Dawson. And it's a wonderful uh, multi-age sort of like, this is what it means to be queer. Do, 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 do. Very matter of fact, appropriate for all ages, you know, but also frank and like, you know, talking about some of the issues that come up. So those are my recommendations. They're absolutely stunning. Only, I mean, there are a thousand I would throw in there, yeah. but I, I would mention The Moon Within by Eva Salazar. Oh, God, and, yes. Because just because it's just stunning. Um, and in verse. Ugh. And in verse. And it's very much censored right now for all the yes. things we're talking about. Yeah. And obviously, Las Musas itself, if you check out the books by many of the Musas, um, in addition to ourselves, you can come across uh, books that would speak to you or to, or to your, your, your children or your students or, or, or in all, all of them. So, yeah. so uh, I don't think that there are any questions. 
Um, I adore hanging out with you. Are there any questions? Let me just put it out there. Any questions? Uh -huh. Um, even, even if they're not, I just to shout out, thank you so much for coming. It's Saturday um, where we are. It's beautiful. Um, the sound of the hose going on. Gardening is happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so just thanking, you know, Sheila, everlasting thanks for, yeah. for your Louisa, support. Louisa. Yes, Francesca, uh, Charles. Um, and 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 everyone here who, who you know just thank you for spending some time with us today talking about this topic and feel free to to get in touch with us yeah on on Twitter if you have other thoughts and then I wanted to throw out there that we're having another mental health um, webinar with Rocky Callen um, de, debut writer um, of a breath too late on May sixth at six p.m. So we'll be advertising that. And I hope, hope, hope in the future, I'll get to spend more time with Alex. Um, and, you know, and come on. You and all the things. I mean, we, we, could, we could literally do this for hours and they would like, we'd drink in cafecito and be like, and then another thing, because that's what we're like. So um, thank you for sharing this with us. I am putting my Twitter handle on there, Charles, for that question. And then uh, Noni will put hers. Um, but again, if you have any, um, if you have any questions about this or anything that you feel that we didn't cover or that was underserved, we are happy to, um, you know, go on there and have this discussion on Twitter or anywhere else. Or there is, yeah, so there, there are going to be other webinars um, coming out from Las Musas, so stay tuned. Yes, but this is a topic that needs to continue to come yeah. up so that we can continue to take care of each other. And so thank you. And with that, are you ready to sign off? <laughs> thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much. Bye.